Hi, everyone. Um, we're letting people make their way into the Zoom and we'll get started momentarily. All right, I think that most, oh, someone's in Tel Aviv, wow, that's amazing. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think most people who are trying to enter the Zoom have been able to do so. We'll give it one more second. Um, and, and then there's we'll more start. coming. There's more coming, okay. Maybe they're not all here. We'll, we'll take another minute and then we'll get going. All right. No, every time our, our lovely event planner for this event told me to, when the participant number leveled off to get started, and every time I think it is going to stay still, then it jumps again. <laughs> but regardless of that, I think we should probably go ahead and get started so we have plenty of time. Um, welcome everyone from all over. I see lots of places in the chat where people are uh, telling us where they're from. We're so glad uh, to have you with us. Well, it's afternoon here in Boston. It's a beautiful afternoon. Um, we're so glad to have you with us for a bit um, as we sort of continue a discussion that we started um, during a webinar last spring. Um, my name is Christina Dobbs. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of English education at BU Wheelock. Um, and I am going to moderate our event um, today because I'm not an expert and I'm excited to learn some new things. Um, I use she, her, and hers pronouns and I'm excited to see everyone. Oh, Mary Ellen is reminding us in the chat that we have closed captioning available for this um, event. If that would be helpful to you, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to turn it on. Um, and we will go ahead and and get started. For those of us who we saw at the first event on this topic, we're glad to see you again and new faces who can't actually see, but we're imagining you. Um, we're glad to see you as well. Um, so welcome back. Um, we'll start with just a round of introductions. Um, in the window, Eleanor is next to me. Eleanor, would you introduce yourself? 
Sure, thank you, Christina. Hello, everybody, and it's wonderful to see many names that I recognize. I would love to see you. Uh, my name is Eleonora Villegas Rumors. I'm a faculty member at BU Wheelock, and I am um, I teach. I'm the chair of the teaching and learning department, and I teach in elementary program and higher education, and um, have a, a very very strong and a big heart for early childhood. So. Thanks, Eleonora. Um, how about Ellie? Um, hi, I'm Ellie Friedland. I teach in the early childhood program of the teaching and learning department with Eleonora. Um, and I do teacher preparation for early childhood student teachers and have long um, had a sort of special focus on creating welcoming environments for LGBTQ plus families, IA plus families, individuals, and most recently also because it's much in demand, um, the spectrum of gender. And uh, our next person, Melody, is somebody with whom I've done that work for many years. All right, Melody, that's your cue. Okay, so my name is Melody Brazo. Um, for about 20 years, maybe a little longer, I was um, first a family liaison and then the welcoming schools coordinator for the Cambridge Public Schools. Um, as a family liaison, I was um, there to help the school district figure out how to be welcoming to LGBTQIA plus families, children, and um, staff. And what I quickly discovered doing that work was that you can't really welcome one disenfranchised group at the expense of all the other disenfranchised groups. And so out of that work grew the sort of uh, broader concept of welcoming schools as a way to think about what it would look like if a school district really walked its talk. And so I was involved in a lot of efforts to think in broader ways about family engagement and about how to really make a welcome palpable in a school district. And um, I left that work about three years ago. And since then I have been doing educational consulting, particularly around race and equity, which um, is what I'm here to talk about today. And I used to teach at Wheelock with Ellie um, and we co-taught a um, course that I can still never remember the name of, and we taught it for years, but it was- Because uh, it's the longest course <laughs> name ever. <laughs> Creating welcoming environments for LGBTQIA plus families and individuals in education, human services, and healthcare. <laughs> yeah. Oh, everybody just called it the LGBTQ course. So um, anyway, I'm happy to be here. That is the longest name ever. Yeah. Um, so just as a couple of points of process, we did have a sort of beginning discussion about this last spring. And if you're curious to check that out, you can go to the BU Wheelock YouTube channel. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of, should be hopefully at the bottom of your screen. Um, we mostly, we have some things to share and also mostly want to answer questions as people have them. So as you start, you know, if you came to the hour with questions already, please feel free to start um, populating the Q&A with those questions. Um, we also have some leftover questions from the last meeting, and we won't worry too much if there's repetition between this time and last time, because there's lots of new folks and we're, and we're super glad that everyone is here. So I'll start with an opening question, which is a bit from the last time. Um, why would each of you say that it's important to directly address bias and stereotypes around race, gender, and LGBTQIA families. So let me start. Um, I think that I have the easier part because I have the part of explaining what, what is sort of expected of young children. And what we know from research, um, I was going to say recent research, but actually also not so recent, is that children notice differences very quickly. 
and they um, even babies notice differences very quickly and they don't know what those differences mean they learn those differences or what they mean or the values that we give or the names that we give to those differences by listening to what other people in their world um, refers to so when they notice the difference and 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 when we deny the difference or when we ignore the difference they learn that there is something hush hush about it and then they begin to create their own theories about things that they can ask or not ask or what is good or what is bad, even though that might not have been the intention of the adults in their lives. So what we know from a very, very young age, and then we notice as they are growing up, and I'm talking about very young uh, preschoolers, for example, that they begin to label um, the differences, but they label the difference based on what they have heard. And they begin to attribute value to those differences differently depending on what you have heard. If as grown-ups, as the adults in the life of children, if we are the parents, if we are the teachers, if we are whoever we are in the life of this kid, if we tend to be very open and very direct and explain the differences that they notice in the most direct way that we can as we discuss every other thing that they ask about, we are hopefully trying to in a way normalize their questioning, normalize the situation and in a way make them comfortable exploring. So what does that mean when uh, so-and-so looks this way and so-and-so looks this other way? Or what does that mean when somebody uh, prefers this or prefers that? And be able to create that line of communication, but at the same time that sort of regular experience that there is no issue with this characteristic or that other characteristic. We um, assume that children are blind to those things and that, or that they are deaf to the things that we say, thinking that they are too young for something, when in reality, um, usually what happens is that they are not young, but we are in a way helping them create theories of mind or way of understanding the world in a way that may be very skewed unless we openly and directly give them facts and describe things at a level that they can understand and with words that they can understand and teach them about how important it is to value everybody, to respect everybody and all of those. So we usually begin with, if you think about all of those who are educators, we always begin with, so who is the person that we are thinking about when we're planning our action? It's always the child, it's always the student. So begin with that when you begin to ask the questions of what should I do or how should I do it? So Ellie and Melody can bring the whole conversation more to the, okay, now from the adult point of view, what does that look like? Well, I think I'd like to start by building on what you said in terms of one of the reasons that very frequently adults um, don't want to talk to young children about race or gender differences or um, sexual orientation differences in particular, because they think they're too young. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what you're talking about is that children are aware of these kind of differences when they're very young and we're not taking away their innocence. I think that's something that adults worry about. And part of that I think is a misunderstanding that when we're talking about these particular differences, um, particularly around gender or sexual orientation and types of families, that somehow we're talking about sex mm -hmm. and we're not. <laughs> um, we're not talking about sex in an LGBTQ family any more than we are in a heterosexual family. Um, so I think that's that's another starting place is that uh, people are not too young. Melody, you, I'm sure you have more about that. Yeah, well, because I, I think the other thing is that um, the whole concept of preserving somebody's innocence depends on other people not getting to be innocent, right? So if you are growing up in a family with two moms, you know that. You know that as soon as you like start to differentiate one face from the other. And so for a straight family to say, I wanna preserve my child's innocence longer, um, that means that you're doing that at the expense of my children who had to know, you know, 
that they had two moms and we had different names and other people had a mom and a dad and that was just how it was. Um, where this really comes up a lot uh, in the work that I've been doing lately is around race. So I've been doing a lot of work with white families um, and, and white people in general. And one of the things that we in the United States learn if we're white is that it's really not polite to talk about race or notice it. Mm. So we get to adulthood with no language no skills, no practice. And then somebody like me comes along and says, you got to talk about race with kids. And, you know, people get a little panicky because they don't know how to do it. And that makes perfect sense. Um, if you grow up in a family where um, people aren't white, if you grow up in a family where people have brown skin, um, you talk about race as soon as you start talking, right? It's a very normalized conversation. And so we get this real disconnect when um, kids of color and white kids go to school together because, uh, because they're coming with um, different understandings of what's polite to talk about, what's right to talk about, what they've practiced talking about. The adults don't know what to do necessarily. And so, um, so part of our work here today is to um, begin to unbraid all of that stuff and open up the conversation so that there are entry points for adults who don't feel so comfortable having these conversations yet. And so there are entry points for adults who have been dying to have these conversations and haven't had an opening and really need one, um, all in the service of what's best for kids. I see a question in the Q&A that I think makes sense um, to address now. Can you talk a little about successful ways you found to introduce these conversations in less diverse classrooms? Um, and I wanna start by, by responding a little bit to the less diverse part of that question in that there are many different kinds of diversity and um, they don't, they're not always obvious Cultural diversity, which can also connect to race, may not be obvious by the way somebody looks. And definitely um, gender and sexual orientation differences could well be much more present in any environment than people are aware. Um, and particularly if the environment does not give messages that it's safe to be who you are and to bring that into the environment, then people are less likely to um, be out about that. And so there could be people in an environment who have those differences. And in order for those differences to actually be present and to know that they're there, there already has to be messages that it's safe to do that. Melody, you wanna pick up from there? Well, in, in terms of race, um... So I'm kind of guessing that, that this might be a question coming from someone in a community where a lot of the kids are white, a lot of the families may be white. Um, and um, I think that's a reality in, unfortunately, a whole lot of places. Um, so um, we are lucky to live in a time when there is just a ton of opportunity to introduce kids and ourselves to a broader kind of diversity than we may have thought existed. I mean, you can go to any number of social media sites, you can go to YouTube, you can look at um, children's books, you know, children's TV shows, and you can start to think about um, like, what are kids looking at and how could I expand that to normalize a broader range of humanity? One of the things that I sometimes ask families to do is to do a space audit, go home and like look at your kids books and your kids toys and the, the art you have hanging in your house and the kind of movies that you watch on family movie night and who's in the video games, right? Um, so that might be for slightly older than preschool kids, but um, like in all those ways, you can get a sense as an adult of what kids are seeing. And then you can start to broaden that and you can ask questions like, you know, 
ask questions about who's in this story, who's missing from this story, what what would make this story look more like the rest of the world, you know? Um, and that's going to make kids ask you questions, and some of them may be kind of hard and complicated to answer because eventually your children might start asking questions like, why are there only white people at my school? Um, you know, it's important for us, if, if you look like me, it's important to learn enough of the history of the United States to be able to answer that question knowledgeably and truthfully. And some of the knowledge and truth about those answers is pretty ugly. So um, that's probably a conversation for a different day, but it's out there and it's available. And um, a lot of us didn't learn it in our own uh, experience in grammar school, high school or college. So now it's on us to learn it now. Add that I think that there is also very important to keep in mind the age of the child that is asking the question, because the answer may be very different if you are getting that question asked by an eight-year-old than if you are getting that question asked by a three-year-old, and it is important for us to think about, as you say, the paying attention to. So, what books are we exposing them to, or what stories are we talking about, or? Um, do we, when we are out in the street, do we uh, notice something? Do we ask them if they notice some difference and then talk about what that means? Those kinds of things. I remember, and just even um, if you go, and I'm not advertising here anything, but if you go and watch some of the Disney movies, they are very, very specific racial groups that are presented in positive or negative ways. And as a mom of two children, I remember the first time that we watched um, Lion King together and they were very very young and one of the things that they noticed right away is that the the accent that mom has was similar to the accent that the hyenas had well the hyenas are not the good guys in that movie so they ask why do they put that accent mom in those in and they were very young and we, I had to talk about well you know they try to represent different groups and it's very unfortunate that they chose to represent the Hispanics in that way or the Latinos in that way that kind of thing it, it was a very very different co conversation when when probably when they were six or seven years old and we watching the movie again and then I took the opportunity to let's talk about this you know when you were little you asked this question so we have to be also very mindful of where the children are in their own understanding about stuff to see how we address the difference, not deny the difference, not say, oh, we don't talk about that or no, that's not important. It's literally address it, but address it at a level that is understandable for them. So for parents who may be sitting here or teachers who are doing this for the first time, if you're teaching three and four year olds, you don't have to go into the complexity of the political issues that we have in this country about all these differences. But if you are teaching much older children, it is important that you do address those issues. They ha you have to, in a way, address the, the, the issue in a developmentally appropriate way. But beginning with a simpler answer and acknowledgement that, oh, I'm glad that you noticed that, even just even uh, in a way, con um, confirming it's good that you notice that and I'm glad that you're asking that question it's a very important piece that we can do for children because then you open lines of communication for the next time that they notice something and one of the um so Disney's a really good example because I think it's so pervasive in child culture um one of the um incidents uh that I remember um a few years ago uh there was a group of kids playing on the playground. This was a group of preschool girls and they were gonna be princesses, except for the brown girl couldn't be a princess, they told her, because princesses all have long straight hair and she had short curly okay. hair in puffs and princesses don't have puffs. And so this little girl was devastated and the teachers um, kind of didn't know how to handle that. You know, and I think part of what um, part as a teacher or as a parent, part of what we need to be doing is counteracting the disnification of kids imaginations with more information. So, um, for instance, there's a great I wish I could remember the the artist, but someone who did a series of photographs of 
brown children dressed as royalty. And um, you, it's pretty easy to find on the web. Um, and they're beautiful photographs. You could put those in your classroom. You know, you could look at those together with your kid at home some evening just to sort of expand their understanding of what is possible. Um, and the really important thing is that that's something important to do whether your kid is brown or white or any shade in between because everybody needs that expanded vision. A couple of things. Um about that one is back to the original question about what can you do in the in the classroom uh, when there isn't a lot of diversity mm -hmm. the materials that mm -hmm. you have in your classroom are of vital importance mm -hmm. uh, from the images if there's images of families images of individuals who is included who is not included definitely the books that you have and it is no longer difficult to find a good range of books with um, main characters of various races, sexual orientations, genders. Um, they're very available. I also just wanted to say one thing about the Disney-esque and other classics that may be full of racism and sexism we can still read those. I know mm -hmm. a lot of us love those. I, one of the things that happens often in conversation with my early childhood colleagues is they love the Disney films. We can still watch those with children, but watch them with a critical eye and mm -hmm. with the kind of conversation that Eleonora was describing and not wait for them to bring it up. Mm -hmm. In the same way that we don't address race, gender, and different kinds of families in the early childhood classroom only when children bring them up. I think there's enough fear from adults that we say, oh, well, we'll deal with that if it comes up. Um, and if everybody is white in the classroom, maybe I don't need to talk about race. Or if I don't know if there's any LGBTQ families, I don't need to talk about different types of families. Um, that's not sufficient because we're all living in the world together and everybody needs to be represented and acknowledged as existing. Um, one of the aspects of hesitation when we're worried about addressing these issues is that often it results in the adults being silent and silence is never support. Silence is ignoring, is um, in making anybody whose life is not represented, making them invisible. And I have a story about something so benign, but it was shocking to me. My goddaughter at five um, had been read to, you know, from before she was born and got glasses when she was about two. And when she was five, we were reading a book and she got so excited because there was a young girl in the storybook who had glasses. And she commented on it and it was so excited. And I thought, she's five years old and this is the first time? And that's just glasses. You know, think about children of different colors, adults of, of different races, different makeups of families, students and adults with disabilities. All of these people tend to be invisible. And we have a responsibility to bring those images and those lives into the classroom. So our, um, one of our, our guests, Britta, put a recommendation for a book in the chat, which is, um, which is, thank you so much for doing that. I do think, Ellie, one question I hear a lot that came up last time is about um, this point you made about we can still watch the Disney movies. People feel a lot of stress, especially if they're not a member of a particular group, um, about sort of the representations they see in stories. How do I know if it's a good story? How do I know if it's a, a good, you know, representation? And I wondered if you had thoughts about people making those judgments. Um, I think how to get good information to answer that. One is we must educate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we need to raise our own awareness and consciousness about microaggressions, about stereotypes, mm -hmm. so that we recognize them in the material that might be very familiar and much loved to us. Um, 
and may, Melody, maybe you want to talk more about that. But the other thing is um, that we should always use our regular critical eye um, when picking out, um, say, books that we read or materials. Everything that's now being published that has more diversity in it is not necessarily good. Um, so you always want to use your regular critical eye as well as um, we really need to do our own homework to be ready to identify stereotypes and biases and know what to do with them. And I think this is a good place to say that this is um, the, the work of developing our critical eye is a life work. It's, the, it's not like you do it and then you know, at the end of the semester, you've passed that course and you are done. Um, so, uh, so wherever you are right now, the good news is you've got work to do and you'll get better, right? Um, and you'll never be finished. Um, and I think, so, um, so I'm thinking uh, when, when Ellie was talking, when, when my kids, particularly when my oldest kid was, uh, growing up, I was so excited to get to read the books that I had loved as a child. And so when she was about six, I got the Little House on the Prairie series and started reading it to her. And I was just horrified over and over and over again at how incredibly racist and, um, you know, not even like the, the parts about sexism and, and gender, but just like the race stuff was horrible. And um, and so I had to keep stopping and saying, oh, well, here's a place we need to talk, you know? And um, so I didn't stop reading her the book, but I had a really different vision of it by the time I was done. And unfortunately, I found that experience over and over again as she was growing up, that books that had meant a lot to me often turned out to be problematic in ways I had never seen as a kid. Um, and part of that's because I was a child and part of that's because I didn't have that lens because nobody was talking about that stuff when I was growing up. Um, and uh, I don't feel like it ruined the stories for her. I don't feel like it ruined the stories for me. I do feel like it was a different kind of educational opportunity than I expected. Um, and it was still a good experience. I'm wondering if anybody um, has questions about specifics, um, specific areas that you're nervous about or that you're not sure how to approach or language. This, this is a huge topic and we don't have much time. So it would be great if anybody has any burning question or burning issue that, um, that you let us know. I agree, not enough questions in the chat. Um, we would love to hear that. Um, so, oh, there's one that appeared. Thank you, anonymous <laughs> attendee. Um, it says, what role do you think higher education plays in teacher prep concerning these issues? A huge role. <laughs> <laughs> it's our job to, to help prepare future teachers. Um, and I will say that in most teacher preparation programs, it is just beginning. Um, at Wheelock College, we were focusing on it, I think, before most places. And I think there has been an awakening in the last couple of years, but it's still slow. And I'll Eleanor, say, you, yeah. in my work um, with teachers, um, so of course, there are people who've already gone through the preparation. For the most part, they got a lot of... Um, preparation in whatever content area they were um, getting prepared to teach. They did not get a whole lot of preparation in how to have complicated conversations with a room full of 25 kids who all have different opinions. And that's, um, that's what makes this really scary for teachers um, because they're supposed to be experts. And so if you are feeling way the opposite of expert in, in this particular topic that comes up suddenly in the middle of you trying to teach math or language arts or even in the middle of you trying to teach, you know, read a story to four-year-olds, um, that's, 
that's a scary moment. And um, that is, I think, what motivates the three of us to be saying, you have to do your homework outside of the classroom somewhere um, so that you feel more prepared to have these conversations. And I will say that while we're waiting for teacher preparation programs to do a better job of this, there are ways to get professional development for teachers. Melody and I both do a lot of professional development in the community. I have only an early childhood focus and Melody's goes up into older grades and adults. Um, also the Welcoming Schools um, website through the Human Rights Campaign has a lot of materials. There are other resources as well, but I don't think anybody can venture into this sort of on your own. You need support. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you didn't get that in your teacher preparation program, politic with your principal or your center director to have a PD focused in these areas. Uh, along I want well, I just want to plug one resource along with the uh, welcoming schools. Um, gender spect gender has a lot of really good classroom materials around gender and um, not only talking about it in the classroom, but also supporting um, students with a variety of gender identities. Sorry, Eleonora. No, it's okay. I was going to say that when we think about higher education and higher education's role, it depends. What I have noticed is, as, as Ellie say, this is coming in very slowly. What I have noticed is that it's not coming very slowly when we're preparing secondary education uh, teachers. So when we are te when we are preparing in, in the education of math and science and English, we tend to have courses where the students address that. And I have also noticed that the students are experiencing, this is the age when most high school students are beginning to think about their own identity. So the teachers or student teachers many times are experiencing the questions of their own students about their identity. So they are bringing that into the higher education classroom and, and it makes it like very natural conversation. That's not the same when we are preparing elementary teachers or early childhood teachers because the, again, they are in classrooms where probably many of the teachers who tend to be the supervising practitioners tend to avoid the topic altogether. So unless we in higher education bring up the topic, we cannot expect necessarily that the, the teachers in preparation are going to bring it up to us. But I have noticed in the past five years that there is a growing interest when I'm teaching students who are going to be secondary educators, which I'm doing this semester, or even right now I'm teaching a course for people who are going to work in higher education. Huge, huge, important topic. They Everybody have questions and they want to talk about it and they are literally looking for more information and more preparation. It is when we're working with the younger children or preparing the teachers for the younger children that we're lagging behind. And I'm hoping that we will catch up eventually because if you think about it, many of the questions that the secondary teachers are facing are, are being faced because nothing is happening or very little is happening in elementary and early childhood. And that if we had more of a continuum of educating children and students about these issues, it would be less of an issue when they get to the adolescent years and less of an issue of how do we do this and how do we approach that? And that, by the way, is true also for parents, that parents usually begin to pay attention to these issues that they have ignored for some time once the child begins in, enters the adolescent years and then they want to know, how do I address this issue when my child is asking me this? Mm -hmm. So we as adults, I think, should think of us ourselves as the responsible ones for taking sort of the in charge of how do we begin the conversation? How do we begin the education? That's an important thing. The other role for higher education that I don't want to let go is we are also always doing research. So many of the things that I mentioned before that we now know that even babies notice um, or even very young children notice differences and they, they don't have a value attached to the difference until they learn it from us. That comes from research that has been done in higher education. So we are also the creators of, or the, in a way, the, the, the students of what happens out there in the world to try to then 
bring it back and say, we need to write about this. We, this, we need to distribute this information that we have collected through serious research. And that's what we're basing these recommendations on, is research that either we have done or colleagues have done that we can report on. And that's, I think, an important message too. So there's a handful of questions in the chat, which I'm excited about. I just wanted to also add in my own teacher preparation with working to train teachers, I think everything that has been said is essential. I also think we send new teachers out into the world to be the newest person in their building, which may or may not be where we would like to be. And mm -hmm. so advocacy is a skill set just like any other. If you want to send teachers out in the world to advocate for better systems, we have to focus on the skills that are needed to do that sort of work. And that is, is an additional sort of set of things to be thinking about. Do my teachers know how to go into a school that may or may not be doing this work and to advocate for the whole place and not just, you know, I, I'm hopeful that they're doing it in their in their one classroom, but we need bigger changes than that. And that can't necessarily be made by the newest person who just got hired yesterday. That's right. Um, <laughs> so I think we have to think about that piece of the system as well. Um, but I'm, I, I just want to say something about that. And then I, I've got to read the things in the chat and I, I have some thinking about how to respond to yeah, like three sure. of them all together. At once. Oh, but, good. Um, and not just to um, do uh, an advertisement. We are starting a new master's program um, at BU Wheelock in leadership advocacy, leadership advocacy and something, I can't remember now. Um, for for well -being. Early, and well, no, for early childhood well, leader, well -being. early leadership and advocacy for early childhood well being. Um, and it, it will be an opportunity to um, take a master's program that is not specifically an education program that addresses all of these kind of issues and equities policy um, and is very much a self-defined and self-directed. Um, so people can contact us if they have questions about that. Um, I was looking at the questions in the Q&A and I, there's a few questions that I, I'm going to try to sort of but bunched together. Um, the first one is from Jessica about it's important to be equitable when supporting kids and their learning and mistakes and districts have behavior rubrics and some have anti-bias reportings that we'd like to hear more about. I don't know about that. Um, what are your thoughts on how to support young children as they are learning from their mistakes? Are they, how do they, how do you allow them to make mistakes? And then another um, person asked um, thoughts on supporting parents is, as they're trying to introduce racist sexual orientation to their children through books, movies, conversations, and the children are still outwardly expressing preferences for children who are like them, who look like them or who are like them. Um, and a good way to discuss, yeah, I think we're sort of addressing all of these. So the first thing I wanna say is we're all going to make mistakes in all of these areas, not only the children. Um, we are learning about this. These are areas that for many of us have been taboo, that we have been taught to stay away from. And we all also have biases that we're not aware of, that we haven't identified yet. So we are making those mistakes, all of us. So we have to have an opportunity to make our own mistakes and for children to act on what they have been taught so far. Children are not born with prejudices. They are very early looking at differences and noticing differences, but they learn preferences and, and dislikes. Um, so we can help them go past that. It certainly should never be a punishment. Um, but to, I think the challenge for us adults, and this is parents and teachers, is to address these mistakes or preferences explicitly. And to talk about, um, yes, this is what, you know, a lot of us know the, the, now pretty old book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Yes, that is what happens. And we need to um, 
bring it into our conversations and into our expectations of ourselves first and of the students that we work with. And Melody, I can tell you have something to say. Well, <laughs> yeah, so um, so I have so, so many thoughts swirling around. <laughs> One of them is, um, uh, I used to I, I used to get um, invited into uh, um, conversations around bullying um, because families would be so distraught and um, you know uh, one of the things that I noticed was that um, it's it's really hard to peel apart when kids don't like each other, what's going on, right? Because there needs to be room for kids to just like who they like. Mm -hmm. um, but, or and, that doesn't mean, uh, so you can't really enforce like friendships, right? Friendships just happen, it's some kind of chemistry, we, we don't know. On the other hand, people need to be kind to each other. And I think that there's, there's a piece of, um, working with kids around, like, you don't have to be friends with everybody, but you have to be kind to everybody. That's really important to be very explicit about over and over and over again. And then adults need to live that as well. And so if kids are seeing us um, trash talk certain adults or certain groups of people, um, it, does, it becomes meaningless when we say you have to be kind to everybody. So, um, so there's that. And then the other thing I want to say is about mistakes. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, maybe the only gift of making a mistake publicly is that you get to model how to repair it, right? And kids really need to learn that. They need to see adults doing it. Because if the only time kids see the requirement for repair is when they or some other child makes the mistake, then it becomes like a baby thing that, you know, that they, that they assume they're going to grow out of. Um, I think it is incredibly powerful for students when their teacher says, you know what, I said this thing or I did this thing and I've had some time to think about it and I think I need to apologize. I think I was wrong. I wish I had said this instead. I wish I had done this other thing. Whatever it is, um, I think that those are um, really, really important educational moments. I think the other thing is, and you said that melody so fast that let me sort of try to bring it back. It is very important for us to acknowledge with kids that they um, definitely they can like or dislike anybody, but they should not generalize to the, the group that that person right. belongs to. So if I am a girl and I all of a sudden dislike this one boy, that doesn't mean that I need to dislike all the boys or that I am, uh, I don't know, white, and I dislike this one person who is, I don't know, of Asian descent, and all of a sudden I'm going to make a generalization about it. And I think that when children, and it's not unusual, by the way, in a very, very young age that children begin to generalize different things, it's important for us, the adults, to call them on that. Yes. And to say, I noticed this, I noticed, and you know, it's okay that you don't da da da, but that doesn't mean that everybody who looks like him or everybody who, and begin to, in a way, separate for them because they are, again, creating theories of mind, right? So they are creating the what makes me like somebody or not. And they take the more salient, evident characteristic to decide, oh, I don't like him. That means that I don't like any of these people as opposed to, no, I don't like this individual and that there's nothing wrong with not liking. I need to be uh, nice and, and kind, but I don't need to like them, but let's not generalize it to the others. And that's true in race, in ethnicity, in gender, in anything. It's not, it's literally, it's the, the teaching, it's at the very, very beginning of teaching of do not generalize anything to anybody because each individual is an individual. So there's um, there's sort of a handful of questions um, that sort of connect to the same sort of issue. Um, 
One of them is from um, Dina Castro, who's our new colleague at Wheelock. Hi, Dina. Um, they have to do with what how teachers might think about if students are getting sort of conflicting messages between home and school, if there are learning stereotypes at home or in their communities, and they're sort of getting different messages, how teachers might address that. Yeah, and Barry asks a, a related question right. about families who are encouraging their children for with sameness and you know be with the people who are like you. Um, and an initial response to both of those questions is that everybody knows about code switching. Everybody knows that there are different things that we do at home. There are different rules at home, different things we learn at home and different ways we speak, different ways we dress, different ways we are, and different rules at school. So a starting point um, is, first of all, I believe really strongly that we're not in a position as teachers to have anybody to suggest that anybody needs to change their beliefs. We have the experience of coexisting with families who have very different beliefs than we do in other areas. Um, if a family disciplines their children differently than we do in school, we know how to respond to that and we know how to accept that. We get more worried about race and gender and sexual orientation. So one thing is that we can always start by saying that, um, you know, first of all, the starting place is we all want what is best for that child, for that person's child. And this is what we do at school. Um, because at school, we are committed to supporting everyone and accepting all types of families, all types of individuals, and including everybody's lives in what we do in school. This is particularly apt at early childhood because that's the focus of our curriculum. Um, we're not into you know, subjects like we are in higher grades. So it is completely okay to have different opinions uh, and different beliefs in school than at home. What's important is that we maintain a positive partnership with those families, even mm -hmm. if we disagree. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, in Massachusetts, um, a lot of what we're talking about here is actually uh, are, are people who are legally protected, right? So right. In, um, in our schools in Massachusetts, uh, it doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter what your family structure is. It doesn't matter what race or religion or level of physical ability you have. Um, all of those things are legally protected. And we as educators are required to support all of those people. And so one of the conversations that I sometimes have ended up having with families is, we totally want to protect and support whatever beliefs you have at home. And we also need to be doing the same thing for all the other families that are sending their kids to this classroom. So, um, so, so we all have a piece, we all have a stake in this and it can't just be about your particular um, family values if they are going to conflict with our ability to protect these and, and serve well and welcome these other people. And I think just even extending that a little bit more, because we live in a very, very diverse society where we at least in paper say that we are respectful and protect legally every group, it's extremely important also to educate our students about our students, meaning the little ones, not, not the college students for now. I, I will address that later, but the little ones about the importance that we actually can have very, very different point of view and very different value systems, as long as we do not try to impose our value system on other people, and as long as we respect everybody's value system. So mm -hmm. that if their families believe something, we have the right to say, well, I disagree with them, but I respect that they have that kind of value system. And in a way, begin to teach at a very young age what it's like to live in a very diverse society where we have to learn how to live together, respecting everybody without imposing any values and discriminating against anybody. 
by doing that, we are teaching the young children now coming back then to higher education. We also need to do that with our students who are preparing to be educators because they need to know how to address that. And it is one of the hardest things. We, we always tend to, tend to take about to talk about family school partnerships as if it is an easy thing to establish. And no, it's not, particularly when you are working with families who do not agree with the kinds of values and readings and materials that you have in your classroom. And you still have to acknowledge that no, but by law. And that usually helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. That is not, it's not only my choice, but it's also by law, I am representing everybody who lives in this society and this community and, and we're preparing teachers to teach children to do the same thing. I, I just wanna quickly address the question that somebody asked about a leader of an early childhood center, intimidating mm -hmm. parents and using fear um, toward kids and families. I, I don't think we can answer that. I think um, the question is, how do we report them, et cetera? I think that's an issue of whatever your school district is um, and however that works. I don't know, Eleonora, do you have anything different about that? I think that in, if you are talking, if it's somebody who is in Massachusetts, you should report that center to the Department of Early Education and Care so that they can do an investigation about what's going on because that is not appropriate behavior and it goes against the standards of the Department of Early Education and Care. So we are in, as a state in that department and I'm not in the board anymore, but we are, we are a state that, re, that really represents and values and celebrates diversity. So if somebody is intimidating families because of something that they are, whoever they are, they need to be reported and, and, and actually question, um, are they the best kind of person to be directing an early childhood education center in, in the state of Massachusetts? Now, if it is in other states, I don't know the regulations, but I would assume that it's the same because as Melody says, these are characteristics that are protected by law. So you cannot have a, a leader of any educational setting, a center um, going against the law in, in the state, in the country. The last question that I saw is about how do you, what, what do you think about um, doing, I guess, trying to address these kind of inequities when our leaders um, are doing things like that we're working about not doing. I guess partly I want to say it's, yup, that's how it is. <laughs> it ain't new. Um, and what we do is we figure out where we can make a difference and we do the work that we're doing and we make sure that we address these issues in our classrooms and in our families um, and hopefully pol be politically active. Um, and yeah. I think and I think that if the question comes from a child that, well, but the president says, or well, but the governor says, or whoever they are referring to at that moment, there is nothing wrong with saying, well, you know what? Even grownups make mistakes. And I think that he or she doesn't have enough of the information that they need to have in order to realize that they need to be more, more kind or kinder to other people. And acknowledge it upfront that because in a way also think about and, and my other side of my education comes into play here is we need to prepare children who are going to live in a democracy. And how do we teach them to live in a democracy if they don't learn that they have also a responsibility to say that government official is not an appropriate government official to be in charge of anything at this moment if those are the values that that government official is espousing. So we really need to also think about that long term. For very young children, it's just say, well, you know how I said the other day that I made a mistake? I think that other grown-ups also make mistakes. And just acknowledge that it's not appropriate to do that. You can even be more concrete and say, it's not kind that he said that, or it's not kind. And remember that here at school, we say that we need to be kind to everybody, something like that. Um, if you were about, about to say something. Um, well, I was, and then I noticed the time. Um, oh, okay. Just that I, I think in these, um, in these times, it's actually even, this work is even more important, right? Yep. Um, and, uh, and we are not only, we're, we're growing the next generation. We're growing the, you know, when we adults get old, 
the kids we're teaching now, the elementary students are going to be in charge of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly have a huge investment in making sure that the people who are in charge of the world when I'm older are prepared and capable insofar as I can help them be that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Rachel mentioned feeling frustrated sometimes at the lack of progress in the chat. And I, and I think um, one of the things that actually helps me feel less frustrated and less hopeless about this is actually having these conversations and doing this sort of work and seeing progress being made. And I always tell, you know, my own students when they're not feeling hopeful, my teacher candidates that um, part of the beauty of teaching is, is building the world that we hope to live in someday. And so with that said, Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us um, for this hour. And we are so grateful for you for your time. And we hope that some good conversations, some threads got started, potentially some resources. Um, we will post this um, panel again on the YouTube channel if you'd like to refer back to it. Um, and thank you so much, everyone. And have a wonderful rest of your day or evening or whatever time it is where you are. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye, everyone. Bye.